All right, so we show a lot more participants than we see in the windows. In addition to, if you just joined, in addition to voting for Action Heroes, we are gonna do the Academy Software Foundation Birds of a Feather. Uh, David has put up this poll just to uh, give you a chance to test the polling system that we're gonna use later for our discussion. Um, and Daniel already mentioned in the chat, feel free to use the chat anytime you want. Feel free to use your camera. And in fact, we're still a couple minutes away from starting. So if you just wanna say hi to somebody, feel free to do that too, because we want this to be as much like a birds of a feather where we're all in the same room as possible and keep it as interactive as possible. Hey, Rob Bredo. Nice painting in the background there. Joe, you recognize my brother's work back there. Sure do. It's <laughs> awesome. Good to see you. Likewise. Very fun. Draw, sir. Hey, hey, Eric. I see a lot of familiar names and a lot of names that I'm not familiar with in the in the participants list. So welcome everyone. At 120 participants, I'm really, I know this is a different format, but this is this is great. And we had already had uh, our open source um, mini conference last week, which was really well attended and uh, fantastic updates from all our projects in detail. So if you missed that, um, this is a great way to get caught up on some of the highlights today, in this hour and the next. Karen, welcome. Thanks for introducing yourself on the chat. Hi, I'm from uh, DC Seagraph chapter on, on the board for the professional chapter. Glad to see you. Everything is, seems to be working very smoothly today. Good to meet you. That's great. We were hoping that we'd all get to meet at the convention center. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> No, not even close. Not even close. <laughs> I see Pete Siegel, Sam Richards, a couple of folks I recognize. A lot of folks I recognize in joining. So welcome, all of you. Good to see almost 200 people already here, right at the top of the hour. If you haven't already had a chance, David has put up this poll. Um, of course, we are interested in who your favorite action hero is, but we're more interested in you, know, you having the opportunity to go to that URL at the top and test it out, because we will be having a conversation. We'll be using the system to have a conversation, especially towards the end of our session. So if you haven't had a chance to vote and test that it's working, go ahead and give it a shot. And at the last possible moment, Arnold Schwarzenegger starts to pull ahead in a shocking, oh, maybe not. It's gonna be neck and neck. interesting with over 200 people voting to see what happens here nice to see people introducing yourselves on the chat and as Daniel mentioned right at the top um, feel free to use the chat throughout the session we'll be keeping an eye on that we will have time for Q&A at the end um, but feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll even try to type question answers to some of those questions if we can as we go along, um, just because I'm sure this hour will be very full. Look at Sigourney Weaver, take the lead right at the end here. <laughs> David, should we dive in since we have a fairly full agenda today? Yes, and uh, that poll stays up for, um, you can continue to enter your vote, but let's get on with it. So, welcome. This is our Academy Software Foundation open source software for visual effects and animation, Bird of a Feather. We have a great group of presenters for you today. My name is David Morin. I'm the executive director of the Academy Software Foundation, and I work at Epic Games in my day job. Presenting will be Daniel Heckenberg, um, our tech chair, and also R&D supervisor uh, for graphics at Animal Logic. 
and we're going to have Carol Payne, uh, co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group, who's also imaging specialist at Netflix, and Rachel Rose, also co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Group, as a, working as an R&D supervisor at ILM. And last but not least, Rob Bredow, chair of the governing board of the Academy Software Foundation and senior VP, executive creative director and head of ILM. So all together, we're going to um, go through a number of updates for you. Uh, as Rob mentioned just earlier, uh, we have a few polls and we'll have a Q&A section at the end. Uh, it's great to have you. And we're going to start uh, with the foundation. Um, the, um, in, the, in this short segment, I'm going to talk about how um, our, we came from where we're at, and we had the poll already. So, um, and the first thing we want to show is a short showreel uh, that will uh, uh, that has been uh, built around projects that use the open source projects that are hosted at the Academy Software Foundation. And uh, as I do that, you will forgive me for a second. I'll go in and out, and share with sound, so that we're back with the video. Every single part of the filmmaking process is touched by software. And a lot of that software is open source software. The Academy Software Foundation exists to provide a great home for open source projects that we as an industry use every day. user of open source software, or an engineer, or a company that relies on open source software, we want to create the right ecosystem for you to get the most out of the open source software that you need to use. And so the Academy Software Foundation, um, where does it come from? Um, many of you, I'm sure, have followed our progress and you're aware of the history. Uh, for those of you who are just coming to be in touch with the foundation, here's a, a quick recap, a quick timeline of our progress. Um, the foundation came out of an investigation that took place at the Academy SciTech Council for about two years, an, uh, an investigation that was uh, focused on the role of open source software in the motion picture industry. And the conclusion was to create an organization that would help develop open source further. And in August 10, 2018, two years ago now, uh, the foundation was created by this group of companies that you see there are founding members, companies that um, decided to not only um, do something about open source um, in, in creating an organization, but also committed fund to get it started. These were our founding members. We're eternally grateful to them. And then shortly thereafter, um, we had our first project, OpenVDB, that was gifted to the foundation by DreamWorks Animation, which is the process by which a project comes to the foundation. It has to be given uh, to the foundation by the company that owns the open source IP. And a new set of members joined us. Shortly thereafter, OpenColor.io came in as our second project in February of 2019 then OpenEXR and OpenQ 
came in uh, quickly in succession. Um, OpenVDB came from DreamWorks, as I said, OpenColor.io from Sony, OpenEXR from Disney, um, and so on. And then uh, OpenTimeline.io uh, came to us, uh, given by Pixar, along with a new group of members joining us. And uh, Apple and Microsoft joined in September 2019. And by that time, we reached a, a milestone in terms of yearly funding of a million dollars a year. And that's one of the many things that the foundation brought to the open source ecosystem is a foundation in terms of dollars and the ability to invest in the ecosystem. We reached that milestone just in time uh, for COVID-19 to hit us, all of us. And um, although it was impossible to plan for COVID-19, nobody did, we were in a position at the foundation where we were able to, to face uh, the situation and um, accelerate, in fact, our activities. And so we have a new uh, project that joined us on April 16th, Open Shading Language, along with AMD and Dockyard. And today at SIGGRAPH 2020, uh, we've, or last week at our open source day, we announced that uh, we have three new members that joined the foundation. Um, and that in a nutshell is the evolution of the foundation up to now. These are the company's members um, of the foundation. And uh, you see names, you, you may be working with one of our uh, member company. Um, if, you, if your company is not listed here and um, you are interested to join, do not hesitate to contact us, to contact me, and uh, we will um, give you more information about the process. Uh, in a nutshell, the mission of the foundation, here you have it. It's about the governance model, legal framework, and the community infrastructure for open source software. And our goals are to provide a neutral forum, a continuous integration, build infrastructure, so that we can share open source build configuration, so that the participation in open source project is clear on how to do that. And we also provide a more consistent licensing for the industry, all items to facilitate the development and adoption of open source software. Open source software in our industry, uh, there's a lot of software and libraries. Uh, we have put together a landscape on our website um, and you can find it at aswf.io. This is an interactive landscape where you can explore all of these various open source software that are used in our industry and find out more about them. So we specifically have six projects in the foundations that have been gifted to the foundation. This is the structure. Um, the, the heart of the foundation is the Technical Advisory Council. This is where the engineers are, the people who are writing the code for our open source projects. They are the ones who make all the important decisions about what to do and how to drive the development. The governing board and the outreach committee are there to serve the TAC and, and clear the way for them. And the TAC is building uh, on the continuous integration platform uh, that all of our project is now based on. And I want to uh, introduce next, for the next segment of our presentation, Daniel Eckenberg, who is the, uh, the chair of our Technical Advisory Council. Daniel. Thank you, David. And great uh, to have so many people here uh, taking an interest in the progress of the foundation and its projects over the last year. So as uh, David alluded, it's been a very challenging time for all of us and indeed for uh, all of the uh, work that happens uh, within our industry and within our projects. Um, I'm very happy to say that I think that uh, our projects have done very well throughout this period. In fact, uh, all of our uh, participants have shown a real resilience um, throughout this time. And I like to think that indeed uh, that is in part uh, a sign of um, some of the strengths and robustness of the open source process as well and some and those things that the foundation has been able to uh, really provide in terms of um, accessibility of resources uh, and breadth of participation in all of our projects. Uh, David, next slide please. So of course the real work of the foundation is uh, in and around our projects and um, over the lifetime of the foundation we've been able to grow to these six 
very strong and active projects which represent a diversity of participation, a diversity of backgrounds. You'll see that um, we've had projects contributed from a number of uh, different uh, industry um, backgrounds and indeed uh, projects which actually serve a number of different parts of our, um, you know, our workflow and our problem space. Um, I won't speak too much about each of those individual projects because uh, we'll be going into a lot more detail throughout the rest of this session. And of course, we have a follow-up session where each of the projects will themselves be able to speak um, about uh, their activity uh, in recent times and of course, uh, looking ahead to the future. So a little bit more about uh, the TAC then and what it means to be involved uh, within the TAC itself. Um, like all of our uh, projects, um, participation in the TAC and the processes of the TAC are, um, are open and we encourage involvement and participation from uh, both members of the foundation, uh, but also the broader community. Um, the TAC itself looks to uh, provide a space for projects to communicate across each other and indeed to gather participation uh, from uh, other interested parties. We take on challenges like uh, trying to agree on best practices, on forging ahead in areas which um, affect all of our projects or perhaps uh, affect all of our industry and participants but aren't yet part of a project. And we'll look at uh, the working group model which has been uh, something that we've been really actively increasing over the last year um, as a mode for us to actually harness energies um, beyond and outside our individual projects. Um, one big area, of course, as well, is to work on the process of making it easier for developers to engage uh, with the industry and with our projects. Um, and that's something that you'll hear a lot more about from our DNI working group as well, coming up um, after my session section. So next slide, please. So looking at how this relates um, in specific terms, obviously uh, we are very happy to be able to draw on the resor uh, resources and advice and guidance of our governing board, um, which is chaired by Rob. Um, and of course, uh, also the support of the Linux Foundation, um, who provide lots of experience from other uh, open source projects and endeavors. Um, some of the key processes that we've really sought to bring um, consistency and uh, ease of access and reliability of access are of course in uh, some of the, not only the technical processes, we'll hear about the CI system, for example, as, an example, as a good example of that, but also things like our uh, licensing and developer um, uh, contribution processes and I think we have a slide about that in a moment just to give an example of what that means. Um, one of the things that we've really sought to do is to minimize the diversity of uh, contribution processes and licenses. So in most areas of course diversity is a very good thing and we uh, hope to encourage it. In this case we've had uh, historically a little bit of a zoo of uh, slight variations on licenses and contribution processes. And this is an area where we've worked very hard with all of our uh, member entities and of course the experience of Linux Foundation to try and bring that number down to a, uh, a minimum quantity, um, taking both projects that have long history like OpenVDB and OpenAXR uh, and also new projects um, or relatively new projects into a much smaller set of licenses. Uh, we have a recommended license, which is essentially the Apache 2 license for our projects. Um, and we've uh, moved through a couple of iterations of streamlining our contributor license agreement processes. So uh, with both a short form process and more recently uh, conforming around the uh, a slight, uh, what's the word, uh, slightly specified in terms of being appropriate to our projects, uh, variant of the Apache 2 CLA um, to manage contribution licenses. So coming back uh, to look at what our working group model uh, actually looks like. Essentially working groups are um, well-defined um, umbrellas for us to uh, focus on a particular area. Um, in some cases, those, uh, that activity might be long running in, this, in the interest of our projects. And the primary example of that is our CI working group, which um, was set up to firstly establish, but now to maintain and extend the continuous integration infrastructure that we, that we and our projects use. 
uh, and indeed has, has uh, taken on a life outside of our projects too, which I'm very happy to see. Um, and in other cases to try and uh, target perhaps more uh, shorter term and well-defined um, challenges facing our projects in our industry. And a good example of that is of course the Python 3 working group, uh, which uh, uses the um, space and the resources of the foundation to provide a space for our, uh, for our industry to actually collaborate across vendors and across studios uh, to look at the specific challenges of transitioning from Python 2 to Python 3, which has been a big uh, endeavor that uh, many of us have been active on for the past year. Um, another good example is our uh, USD working group, uh, which is uh, providing a space alongside, of course, all of Pixar's efforts with USD uh, to continue uh, to support USD and its broader adoption within the industry. So back into a little bit more detail about the CI working group. And so for each of these, I'll flash up a quick slide, which uh, lists essentially the goals of the working group. And um, I've, we have a number of points of contact, but I've highlighted the Slack uh, channels within the ASWF Slack, which I encourage uh, anyone who's interested to be involved or follow along with. Uh, we've got great activity and engagement in all of those channels now, and they're a very nice complement to our other regular meeting processes and uh, repository-based um, collaboration mechanisms. So the CI Working Group um, has uh, allowed us to bring together expertise from um, our projects, from uh, developers uh, associated with our uh, member companies and, and beyond. And of course, some of our key foundation members who are responsible for uh, the software packages and some of the infrastructure we might use. And in order to provide a modern um, and open source uh, compatible uh, CI infrastructure outside of um, any of the individual facilities where our projects grew up. Um, I have a slide in a moment which shows uh, how this infrastructure has evolved. We've moved from a number of different models, starting out with um, a Jenkins-based approach to uh, this configuration, which is much more uh, employing sort of current and modern uh, software as a service components uh, and fits very nicely into the GitHub ecosystem. One example of that was uh, that we migrated from uh, Azure Pipelines to GitHub Actions for a very unified uh, CI process support within uh, GitHub, which is where our projects are all hosted. And one very nice thing about this process is that it allows for all of these pieces to be very uh, easily um, seen. They're all accessible and open and uh, reapplied either to uh, personal forks as far as part of the contribution process to our projects or indeed to other projects where they're suitable. Um, I'll draw particular attention to our use of Docker where for the Linux platform, uh, we've been able to uh, take the um, version specifications and configurations which uh, the VFX reference platform uh, defines um, and actually turn those into concrete example recipes, which can be used directly by our projects and indeed um, any other projects that uh, choose to draw upon those Docker images. Um, and we've also been able to use, you know, moving ahead into the future, those Docker recipes as, um, I think he, I don't know, as a way of testing out um, the VFX reference platform configurations for the future. So uh, it's been a nice uh, opportunity for us to take the perspective uh, specifications and actually run them through with our projects and with other uh, parts of the community ahead of their uh, formalization. So moving ahead. So uh, I gave a quick introduction to the Python 3 working group. Um, this has been uh, an effort chaired by uh, Ashley Wetter from DNEG and um, has been a very nice complement to some of the other efforts across the community to really understand what it means for our process to take this big step ahead, not only in terms of uh, the way that our vendors uh, provide uh, their DCCs and other software, but also how we actually go about um, changing uh, some of the lower level libraries and of course all of our internal studio code. Um, the foundation has, has provides a very nice uh, space for participation across all of these different um, 
units that would otherwise be very much separated and not necessarily have uh, an obvious forum for communication. Once again, I uh, encourage you to check into the Slack channel there um, for updates and involvement. And uh, last but not least for my section, um, I'd also uh, like to draw your attention to the USD working group. Um, there is, in addition to some of the other uh, outcomes there, there's um, a very nice uh, wiki resource coming together um, under the umbrella of the foundation uh, where um, many of the uh, best practices, examples, and um, other information around and beyond the core uh, USD resources that Pixar themselves provide um, is coming together through that working group. And uh, there are some really sort of interesting extensions happening there, which I, I see as great uh, examples of the strengths of the foundation and its, and its efforts. So uh, one thread of activity has been to actually um, build live uh, Jupyter notebooks, which um, allow for uh, allow for USD examples to be run in browser um, with live Python and with, it, with even with graphical outputs. Um, that's using the sort of whole stack of technologies there, the wiki uh, and uh, USD running live on top of the ASWF Docker images, which were developed for our CDI infrastructure. So um, that's a neat example. Those examples aren't actually live in the wiki yet, but if you check in on the Slack channel, uh, you'll be able to see the work in progress coming along very nicely there. So uh, that's a perfect hook for us to move over to hear about the activities of the diversity and working, inclusion working group. Hey everyone, um, I'm Rachel Rose. As David mentioned at the beginning, I am an ILM supervisor, ILM um, R&D supervisor, uh, and it, more importantly for this presentation, also a co-chair for the diversity and inclusion working group. So um, I'm really excited to tell everyone a little bit about what we've been doing to get this working group started. So if you could go to the next slide, David. So um, back in June, the ASWF formed the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. Now this working group is a, very much a collaborative effort to try to advance um, diversity and inclusion within the open source community, and in particular, the open source community for VFX and animation. Um, this is a, obviously a very important topic and something that many of us feel very strongly about um, trying to move forward. Um, so we're really excited that uh, the Academy Software Foundation is really getting behind this and uh, trying to make a huge difference. And now this working group is, is being formed as um, a community of many different types of people. It includes people from a, a broad spe spectrum of different parts of the open source community and the VFX and animation industries. Um, um, both, you know, engineers who know open source software very well, as well as others um, who may not know it quite as well, but are very interested in trying to tackle this specific problem. Um, we will talk more about this later at the end of the presentation, but we are very, very interested in continuing to have more and more people involved in this process. Uh, I think, you know, one of the main ways that you can tackle diversity and inclusion is by having a very diverse and inclusive group to try to uh, drive forward that initiative. Um, so uh, we're really excited to have this um, pulled together now. Uh, so far over the last three months that we have been working, the primary thing that we have been doing is trying to put together a series of um, a set of goals that the working group can be working towards that will take us into the future. So these are supposed to be goals that we can be tar using for a number of years, um, not just in the immediate time frame. So for uh, the bulk of the rest of the presentation, myself and then Carol Payne, my, my co-chair um, will be going over the three goals that we formed as well as um, two initiatives under each of the goals that we've decided to start start with as initial initiatives for those goals so if we can go to the next slide david Okay, so um, goal number one is really around student education. Uh, we, we, it became very apparent uh, through our working group conversations as well as um, a survey that we sent out to our members that, um, that being able to uh, engage young, 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 young adults in particular in um, open source and uh, be able to excite them with motion picture and media industries uh, would be a really great way to start bringing in 
you know, a, a variety of different people into open source for VFX and animation that might not have gotten involved before. So our first goal really is to encourage high school and college students to pursue a career in or participate in open source projects by educating them on uses in motion picture and mo media industries. Um, to start to tackle this goal, the first uh, two initiatives that we are trying to drive forward actively now are to first put in place a mentorship program that's going to be targeted at high school and college age students. We'll uh, be looking for partners at university and colleges in order to um, drive this forward. And uh, we, we have a couple of ideas about how to, to get this started, um, but we feel like this is very important. Um, mentorship has shown to be a, a great way to, um, to increase diversity and um, is something that uh, we, we hope we can, especially with all of the resources of the Academy Software Foundation and all of the amazing members, we feel like we have a, a large group of people that will be able to be uh, actively involved in helping high school and college age students learn more about open source VFX and animation. Uh, the second uh, initiative that we're going to try to push or that we are going to push forward for diversity um, oops, if we go back one more, sorry, <laughs> for the, the student education, is uh, that we'd like to partner with external organizations that promote coding in underrepresented populations, including open source um, and inspiring, introducing open source to these people and inspiring through example. Uh, this is something that, you know, there are a number of organizations worldwide that uh, have relationships with uh, underrepresented populations. And if we can work with those organizations and bring our member projects to those organizations, we think that we can have a really great effect on diversity. Um, I'm now gonna go on to goal two and pass this off to Carol, who will cover the next two goals. Awesome, thanks, Rachel. Uh, yeah, like everybody said, thanks for all the involvement in the chat and, and hopefully we'll be able to get to as many questions as we can. But until then, um, the second goal that we would like to talk about is one that, uh, so, so we're talking about external goals and educating the community at large and students and people who want to learn. It's also really important to uh, look internally at the ASWF um, and also by extension the vfx and animation communities about what it means to be inclusive and to be diverse and so our second goal is around diversity in the academy software foundation itself um, looking at the leadership and membership across the foundation and defining what inclusiveness and diversity looks like for the aswf so we're going to be working uh with our uh, working group members and the rest of the ASWF leadership to define what that looks like. Um, and that's the first goal, that bullet point there. The second one for diversity in ASWF is really getting a solid connection between the working groups and our individual member projects. And so we're thinking about um, how we could accomplish that. And that looks like an actual uh, diversity and inclusion ambassador is what we're calling them, that is integrated into each of our member projects that uh, we talked about before and, and is really focused on working with the projects to uh, help achieve our diversity and inclusion goals, um, things like inviting in inclusive language, um, and then also uh, looking at how easy it is to get involved in the projects if you're just first starting out, things like good first issues and really good documentation and um, it, the list goes the list goes on and on around what we can in, what we can do with uh, our diversity inclusion ambassador who would also then be working with our working group to make sure that we're staying on track and following the goals and being consistent across the board. So that's goal number two. Um, the third goal is a little bit of a, a mix of both internal and external, and we're calling it guidance for members. And Everybody, like Rachel mentioned, is, is, is really feeling the importance of this work and this time and, and for the future and for the success of our organization. And there's tons of good resources out there already on uh, inclusion and diversity topics. Um, and so our, set, our third goal is to resource those, both uh, in terms of blog posts on uh, DNI topics. And those will be written at first by members of the working group um, and members of the projects and 
outsourcing a lot of information that already exists within our member base. Um, but eventually extending that program to to other people who would like to write and uh, have, you know, great information to share in this area. Uh, we already have a blog, the ASWF, that Emily does a great job of running and we're looking to uh, just grow and expand that and uh, make it a real resource for people. In addition to that, we're looking to make a real landing page. So each project has a landing page and a resource and things like that. We're looking to make a, a similar thing for diversity inclusion resources for open source software, building on some of the great tools that the Linux Foundation already has. Um, it is there for us to utilize um, and really make a space for people that are curious and wanna learn more uh, and wanna take things back to their own organizations, own companies, own schools, all of these things. Um, and you know, just build on the resources that everybody has. So those are our main three goals that we've set up in our in our charter. And, um, you know, we're, we're really just getting started. So we're looking for everybody to get involved and have an opinion and, and tell us what they think, and if we're going the right direction, if we're missing anything, um, these things are fluid and always changing. So um, the last slide that we have for you today is how to get involved. Um, and there's two real ways. Um, we have our mailing list that uh, is through email or you know, online, and then um, we have our Slack channel, which tends to be the most active uh, way to get a hold of us. But through the mailing list, um, you can sign up uh, to receive uh, notifications about our meetings, which happen monthly. Um, and we'll be looking to, to you know, change those and adapt those based on our member group. and. We really want to be um, global about this too. So these meetings right now are, you know, in the middle of the day, uh, U.S. time. But obviously, if you want to get involved, we can, you know, there's lots of different ways we can look to do that and increase involvement globally from around the world. Because I see we've got a lot of people from everywhere on the call today, and that's really, really exciting. So yeah, jump on the Slack, jump on the mailing list. Uh, talk to Rachel or I. We'll be happy to answer any and all questions you guys have. And that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Rachel and Carol. Um, it's an exciting initiative to be pushing forward and seeing already interest and progress. I was watching on the chat as people are get interested in getting involved. This is a way, I think, as a organization outside of any one of our individual businesses that are contributing, we can actually be more powerful together than we ever could individually, right? There's nothing proprietary about our diversity and inclusion initiatives. We all want to share our best findings. And we all want more engineers who are from a broader variety of backgrounds to help us do this work. People who are passionate about movies, people who are passionate about engineering, People may not even realize that it's possible to work on these projects and to contribute to the way movies look by writing software and creating pixels behind the scenes, but all of the movies are affected by this. So any one of your students, if you're a teacher or if you are a student, uh, if you have an interest in engineering or technical documentation or even just testing applications, jump in on one of these projects, take a look. Um, you might be able to contribute to something that is used directly in one of these films. OpenEXR, for example, is used on pretty much every image made in the movie business today. So we're excited to be here in the Academy Software Foundation accelerating developments in these areas. In fact, let's just dive into these projects to see um, the kind of progress and the kind of acceleration that has happened in this last year. If you look at OpenDDB, the very first project brought into the Academy yeah, over 3.7 million lines of code change. That seems amazing. Um, there is a whole bunch of exciting stuff going on in OpenBDB in terms of acceleration. And you can see this is from a group, a, um, a number of committers, not just one person, not even just a single person from a single company anymore, even though it started all at DreamWorks. So it's very exciting to see this kind of progress at OpenBDB. The next project is OpenColorIO. And this is a really great story because OpenColorIO has been an important part of managing color in the movie business for the last several years. But interestingly, OpenColorIO um, had slowed down in its development because some of the original creators of the project had gone on and actually changed industries. So when it was adopted into the Academy Software Foundation, it was still widely used, but it wasn't being as actively maintained as it is today. And you can see how much work is going on in OpenColorIO today. The next project, OpenQ, has had a long history at Sony Imageworks. 
um, and uh, just came into the foundation probably just over a year ago, and it's actively being worked on as well, uh, heavily from people at Google, but also from other companies as well. So thank you to those of you who are working hard on that project. And then OpenEXR, that's, uh, a, uh, that's the image software that was created at Industrial Light and Magic, probably the most widely adopted uh, pr package of everything we're talking about here today. Uh, in, term in terms of movies, it's used on every single movie. Uh, but it also had gotten a little bit, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't getting the kind of attention that it deserved. It certainly wasn't getting the sort of innovation that it needed. And that's because everybody has a lot going on, right, every day. But you can see in this last year, it's been very actively maintained. Um, it's built into the Mac o operating system in addition to many of the uh, Linux distributions that are out there. Very, very widely used and now very actively maintained. And there's excitement about the future of that as well. Open Timeline I.O. Pixar's first project in the Academy Software Foundation. Um, very, very cool connecting software between editorial and, um, and any sort of digital workflows in movie production or visual effects and making a lot of active progress this year as well. And the last project, Open Shading Language. This is a fundamental uh, program inside of, it's a program, it's a library that renders use, it's a programming language for renderers to use to describe shading, how every surface is going to look. And very, very actively developed, as you can see, the lion's share of those, that development work is being done at Sony Imageworks. This was just recently contributed to the Academy Software Foundation, so that makes a lot of sense. But you can see already contributions from Intel, Double Negative, and other companies as well, and individuals who may not have uh, stated an affiliation. So even though it's only been a short amount of time, we're seeing some work in this open source package and, and accelerating that, the Academy Software Foundation, by just setting out clear goals, clear ways to contribute, and hopefully attracting additional attention to these projects, um, we're able to um, accelerate the development of these shows, or these projects, rather. So we saved a bit of time at the end here for to hear from you and to have some conversation with you. Uh, let's go ahead and start on the first poll here, David. Um, to talk about what we are doing well, where have, where have we delivered on the most value in the last couple of years? And uh, we'll also talk about where we could deliver more value, what we could do better, or what we should do next. But first, let's start with, if you just go to that URL at the top there, pollev.com slash ASWF. Um, and what are some of the things that the Academy Software Foundation has done well and delivered some value that you think is helpful? And if you're brand new, it's okay. You don't have to participate. But if you have an opinion on this, you can type in your answers and you can also give upvotes. If you see something on there that you like, you can tap it and it'll help uh, raise it to the top of the list. So I'm already seeing some things coming up that people are liking. Helping with the legalese, indeed. So uh, somebody highlighted automated build system. And one of the cool things about the uh, build infrastructure that the Academy Software Foundation has built is it is heavily based, or it's, it's based on, and I think, is it exclusively open source libraries? Uh, almost exclusively, as much as we can, open source libraries. And, this, and the infrastructure itself is open source. So, um, that means you can actually take this continuous integration infrastructure and use leverage it internally if you have any interest. So everything that if you are one, you or one of your engineers is working on it, that can be both very helpful for the Academy Software Foundation, but it also can be very helpful for your own business or operation. Great to see all these answers coming in. It's really fantastic to see over 360 people in this meeting. I noticed we had folks from South Africa and Egypt. Uh, I don't know if you would have been able to attend if we were doing the SIGGRAPH in person, but in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm uh, very thrilled with not only just the number of people here, but what, what a broad range of time zones um, we represent in this room. Um, Daniel, I thought you were the one who was at the earliest, uh, but I noticed somebody chimed in from Adelaide beating you by 30 minutes. So they had to get 30 minutes early, earlier for those. But thank you, Daniel. And I forgot your name from Adelaide uh, for getting up at uh, either 5.30 or 5 o'clock this morning to attend this 
session. Yeah, it's great to see some of these coming up. And the Academy Software Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC, where a lot of these decisions happen, and the governing board are going to be using this information that we get from you at, back in this informal survey to help push, to help direct some of our investments going forward. We did a meeting last week um, doing very detailed di deep dives on each of the projects so people could get updated and uh, a series of meetings last week. And some of the things that popped up there were areas that we were already planning to invest in. It was great to see the participation there. Oh, there we go. Three folks from Adelaide. So people appreciate a few things I'll just highlight before we go on to the next one. Um, the fact that Academy Software Foundation creates a home for all these great open source projects in our industry, I take that to mean uh, both a home and also a, a, an environment that you can trust that will be there for a long time, especially for some of these core libraries and things that we all want to be able to rely on for many years into the future. Visibility, that's great. Just the PR aspect of bringing a visibility of engineers and open source projects into the industry is fantastic. Democratizing software, the legal ease, absolutely. Supporting orphan software, absolutely. It was a high amount, it was a high priority when we started the foundation to take these projects that were incredibly fundamental to our efforts in and our work that we do every day and making sure it had a place that where work could continue to happen. VFX reference platform. This is a fantastic initiative. And just to be clear, the visual effects reference platform is, initiative, is an initiative that we support, uh, but it is actually homed by the Visual Effects Society Technology Committee and started over five years ago in that committee. And it is a fantastic uh, platform. If you want to look it up online, you can Google v v VFX reference platform. And every year, they advertise what versions of key important libraries that have a lot of dependencies, what versions the software provider should be using so that the software has a better chance of interoper interoperability, particularly on Linux. But this year, the big announcement on the VFX reference platform is that they're providing recommendations for Linux, for Mac, and for Windows as well. So this is to help with the problem of versionitis. So uh, we're a huge supporter of the VFX reference platform, and uh, we love that initiative, and um, it, they're doing a fantastic job with it, for sure. And then down just a little further is automated build systems and, and providing these common spaces and getting us talking with each other, which is fantastic. And if you're interested in participating, uh, as Daniel mentioned, the TAC meetings, which are every other week. Is that right, Daniel? I it said something fancy. Fortnightly, that's right. Yeah, what, what, for those of us who aren't smart enough to understand fortnightly, it's every other week? That's right. Okay, cool. <laughs> There we go. weekly, I, twice weekly, all of these things are confusing in their own way. But yes. They are, exactly. <laughs> but every 14 days or so, uh, depending on whether the moon, no, just kidding. Um, yes, every 14 days, the TAC meets. And that is an open meeting. Anyone is, can, is welcome to attend. Um, and just a, a couple other things. We always say this, but the Academy Software Foundation, we provide software with permissive open source software licenses. That means everyone can use it. It's free to use. Um, you can check out the individual licenses, but we try to make them as simple and as clear and as permissive as possible. Um, so whether you are a member or not, you can use the software, you can contribute to the software, you can attend the TAC meetings, all the important decisions happen. You can, uh, you can chime in on all that. Um, as a member, your company is supporting this initiative, which I think is a great investment, certainly for the companies that I've talked to, a, a small amount of financial donation and a, and a full-time engineer which is somebody you assign to the projects you want them to work on. That's a modest investment compared to the investments all of our companies were making individually to try to make some of this stuff happen. So this has been a fantastic collaborative effort we've seen in the industry. So we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, things uh, that we can do to create more value or um, let me see what I actually wrote on there. Uh, yeah, how can we, oh, there you go. I, I, I wrote exactly what I said. How can the Academy Software Foundation create more value either for you or your organization? Um, what would be the kind of things we can do next that would create more value for you? It requires deep thinking. Yeah, exactly. So Jonathan might have 
taken the prize for the earliest start to this morning from Perth. This is great. Finding more standards to adopt is already coming up towards the top. So um, VFX reference platform Docker builds. Daniel, do you just want to talk about that for a minute? Because it came up both on a place we were creating value and a place we could create more value if we made an automatic RPM. So can, uh, where can people go who are interested in that topic? And is it worth giving a brief update on that? So uh, we, let's see. So the Slack channel that I mentioned is probably the first port of call to uh, engage with the people who are uh, actively working on the Docker images and uh, checking into the CI working group, generally looking at the past notes, which are on the um, SWF TAC GitHub um, are a good way also of just sort of seeing the broader context of that work. Um, that uh, comment sort of, uh, suggests that there's already a bit of familiarity with the work and, and an interest in being able to take those uh, Docker images from um, the, the setting in which they're currently used, which, which allows them to be very easily sort of picked up and used for, uh, for CI and for things like the Jupyter Notebooks and actually allow them to be used in a production environment. Um, there are a few additional steps there, of course. Uh, Docker containers are, uh, still have some um, friction or some uh, teething issues, usually with uh, hardware accelerated graphics and other things. So there's a couple of steps there in order to make them really effective as, um, you know, as the platform that you build your uh, production workstations on and so on. But that's certainly an area that um, we're interested in. And as we look to uh, Windows and Mac, where uh, Docker unfortunately isn't, um, as well supported and as capable as it is on the Linux platform, um, we are uh, extending to looking at general package managers as a way of uh, supporting those platforms as the VFX reference platform, sorry, excuse me, reference platform extends onto the, uh, to the other uh, platforms. We're doing the same with our uh, CI infrastructure and for our projects. Uh, and that will naturally uh, include using a, a broader set of package management approaches and I expect that that, in fact, might be the path we take to uh, runtime um, install uh, packages for even for Linux as well. So stay tuned. That's definitely a, that's definitely in scope, um, not only for Linux but also for our other platforms. Great. So the top two topics are um, not surprisingly about adding more projects, and this is something that uh, we are very interested in continuing to do. Um, Open Image IO is a great example. USD is another great example. It became the first and the second item on the list. But just to, as a primer, for those of you who haven't already attended some of these other meetings, the way we ad adopt projects is um, by reaching out to the hosting organization, and in USD's case, it's Pixar, and, and seeing if they have any interest in in the Academy Software Foundation backing the project or adopting the project, and then they would be the ones who would sign that over. Um, so we've uh, continued to have great conversations with our friends at Pixar. They have a project already in the Academy Software Foundation and certainly by being a responsible host for that pro project and hopefully it continuing to accelerate its development and adoption, that'll be a great sign for them to consider a, such a large project like USD. Um, USD is in addition to being a huge open source project, it's also a fundamental uh, tool in their own pipeline over at Pixar. So you can imagine it's a big decision whether to sign over uh, the management of that over to the Academy Software Foundation. Um, but if there's a specific reason, I'm, uh, I'm really interested in learning more. You can chat on the Slack or on the mailing list. If there's a specific thing that you think the Academy Software Foundation can do to help, uh, you could join the working group um, that is already formed in order to support USD. Because whether USD is in the Academy Software Foundation, in the Academy Software Foundation or not, we're interested in supporting it, supporting its successful development and adoption. And it's already an open source package with a very permissive license, very consistent with all of our views. Um, and we would love to continue to support it as much as we can. So um, yeah, so that is the current status on that for sure. And I love seeing more tutorials and adoption on the use of the software. This is uh, better onboarding, which is an area that we haven't really focused on yet. 
And I think it would be really good for us to look at that uh, in the next year as we go from a state of kind of getting the software in a good shape um, for the expert users to users who might be newer to these packages because they're very, um, they require a lot of expertise right now for sure to integrate into your own project. So that's a really good idea. And it, well, that would also be an excellent point of engagement for people who would like to uh, contribute their skills and their understanding of the system. So that ex expands the pool from perhaps sort of hardcore developers to other people who have built the experience of use and of application. We'd really encourage them to be involved to start to help us build um, those onboarding materials. And the next one we particularly love, uh, successfully convince more companies to join, pay up, and donate time. Absolutely. And you can, uh, engineers and companies can work on Academy Software Foundation projects with or without being a member, but we love having them as members. As a member, they get a seat on the governing board. They get to help direct the spending of the Academy Software Foundation, uh, which do things like support these DNI initiatives, um, support the project, support days like this uh, to actually happen. Um, and we do have a, uh, as David highlighted, about a million dollar budget, actually just over a million dollar budget, um, assuming all the companies continue to re-up and participate, which they have, which has been fantastic. Um, we could imagine doing more with more participation, absolutely. And if you are representing a company or an organization who might be interested in a general membership or a premier membership, the premier membership is, uh, is, a little, is more expensive and provides that greater level of support, and the general membership is quite cost effective uh, to be in, deeply involved in the academy. We have, and, and you saw the slide with our supporting companies who were incredibly grateful for. Um, but if you have any questions about membership or how you could support the organization as an, uh, the, the Academy Software Foundation as the organization that you work with, uh, you could reach out to David Marin or I anytime. We'd be happy to speak with you about that. So we have a question in the chat. Um, about uh, is there a non-corporate membership so we have three categories of memberships a premier that gives you a seat on the board general membership and associate membership for the nonprofits and other companies that uh, or organization and that can join the foundation at very little or, or no cost so that they can participate in in the in the movement but we do not have an individual membership at this time um, beyond those three that David just highlighted. Right. Great. And precompiled binaries for multiple platforms. Daniel, is it correct today that most of our projects only have precompiled binaries for the Linux environment? Uh, so it would be correct to say that we don't really offer distributable binaries for any platform. Um, that's, that, again, falls into that category of uh, the package manager uh, space that I referred to earlier, Rob, and uh, that's something that uh, Docker images start to take us along the way to, but uh, really in order to mesh with um, the, the normal sort of production runtime environments uh, in a useful way, we need to look beyond Docker to, to other package managers. Makes sense. Great. Well, if there are, um, well, you know what, I think I've got, do I have a couple more slides in here or do I? To wrap it up, I think I might. Oh yeah, we, we've been doing it. We've been doing the Q&A interactively with this poll, so we can go ahead and leave this poll up. And I think we fielded a lot of the questions that came in the chat, but if we missed something, go ahead and drop it in the chat now. We have only four minutes before our uh, Academy Software Foundation open source project, Birds of a Feather, which starts in, what, four minutes at two o'clock. So um, we definitely recommend you all are gonna wanna attend that. Um, this is really about the overall structure of the foundation, um, a, very light on the details of what's happening on each project. And I gotta say, the projects are very exciting. There's really good updates that you're not gonna wanna miss there. So we will look forward to seeing you in that next meeting for sure. Great, well with that, I think we will wrap it up let you have a minute between now and the next meeting. And thank you so much for your attendance. I really appreciate seeing so many people and really great to see this format working so well for this Birds of a Feather. So just thank you so much for taking the time, uh, especially for those of you who are early and late, but also for those of you who took your lunch hour to be with us today. We really, really appreciate it.